And we're live now on Capitol Hill as the Senate Armed Services Committee this morning is holding a hearing on U.S. military forces in South Korea. A naval aircraft carrier group is currently heading toward waters off the Korean Peninsula. The head of the U.S. Pacific Command, Admiral Harry Harris, is making a second visit to Capitol Hill. He'll be testifying about tensions on the Korean Peninsula and U.S. military readiness. Arizona Senator John McCain is in the chair. He's the chair of the Armed Services Committee. This should start in just a moment. Well, good morning. The Senate Armed Services Committee meets this morning to receive testimony on the posture of U.S. Pacific Command and U.S. forces in Korea. Admiral Harris, I appreciate your appearance before the committee during this tense period in your area of responsibility. And I want to express the appreciation of this committee for the service of the men and women you lead who defend our nation every day. America's interests in the Asia-Pacific region are deep and enduring. That's why for the past 70 years we've worked with our allies and partners to uphold a rules-based order based on the principles of free peoples and free markets, open seas and open skies, and the rule of law and the peaceful resolution of disputes. These ideas have produced unprecedented peace and prosperity in the Asia-Pacific, but now the challenge to this rules-based order are mounting, and they threaten not just the nations of the Asia-Pacific region, but the United States as well. The most immediate threat is the situation on the Korean Peninsula. Kim Jong-un's regime has thrown its full weight behind its quest for nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them. And unfortunately, the regime is making real progress. A North Korean missile with a nuclear payload capable of striking an American city is no longer a distant hypothetical, but an imminent danger, one that poses a real and rising risk of conflict. Indeed, as Admiral Harris said yesterday in testimony before the House, North Korea already has the conventional capability to strike U.S. territory. I look forward to hearing your assessment of North Korea's nuclear and missile programs, the military options your forces offer to our Commander-in-Chief, and their readiness to carry them out if called upon. I welcome the news that the deployment of the THAAD missile defense system to South Korea and other capabilities in the region will soon be completed. It's shameful that China has retaliated against South Korea with economic and cyber means in response to its support for this deployment. This committee understands that deploying this system is a joint alliance decision that is necessary to defend our ally, South Korea. Admiral Harris, we welcome your views on whether further enhancements to U.S. missile defenses or our conventional military posture are required in Northeast Asia to counter the threat from North Korea. For years, the United States has looked to China, North Korea's long-term patron and sole strategic ally, to bring the regime to the negotiating table and achieve progress toward a denuclearized Korean peninsula. We have done so for the simple reason that China is the only country that may have the influence to truly curb North Korea's destabilizing behavior. But China has repeatedly refused to exercise that influence. I welcome the Trump administration's outreach to China on the issue of North Korea. But as these discussions continue, the United States should be clear that while we earnestly seek China's cooperation on North Korea, we do not seek such cooperation at the expense of our other vital interests. We must not and will not bargain over our alliances or over fundamental principles of the rules-based order. As its behavior toward South Korea indicates over the last several years, China has acted less and less like a responsible stakeholder of the rules-based order in the region and more like a bully. It has economically coerced its neighbors, increased its provocations in the East China Sea, and militarized the South China Sea. Meanwhile, with a rebalance policy, too heavy, heavy on rhetoric and too light on action, years of senseless defense cuts, and now the disastrous decision to 
would draw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, U.S. policy has failed to adapt to the scale and velocity of China's challenge to the rules-based order. And that failure has caused into question the credibility of America's security commitments in the region. This committee has grown increasingly concerned about the erosion of America's conventional military overmatch as states like China and North Korea develop advanced capabilities to counter our ability to project military power. While America's military remains the most powerful on Earth, we must adapt to the new realities we face. We must think differently about forward basing and force posture, logistics and mobilization, and take steps to reshape the capabilities of our joint force for the renewed reality of great power competition. Specifically on the issue of munitions, this committee has heard testimony each year about the qualitative and quantitative shortfalls we have in our munitions, but we've seen little action from the services to finally turn the corner and address this issue with serious with the seriousness it requires. Admiral Harris, I'm interested in your views on munitions requirements and what it will take to meet them. The new administration has an important opportunity to chart a different and better course. At our hearing earlier this week, our panel of experts, witnesses, agreed there was a strong merit for a, quote, Asia-Pacific stability initiative. This initiative could enhance U.S. military power through targeted fun funding to realign our force posture in the region, improve operationally relevant infrastructure, fund additional exercises, pre-position equipment, and build capacity with our allies and partners. Admiral Harris, I'm eager to hear your thoughts on this kind of an initiative. And Admiral, I think there's some sim symbolism in your appearance today and the information that the Chinese are now building their own aircraft carrier. I'm sure that uh, as an old naval aviator that uh, that has some interest for you. Senator Reid. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you, Admiral Harris, for being here today. And we understand how difficult this time must be for you and for General Brooks and all the men and women that you lead, and we want you to express our great appreciation for their efforts. Uh, it's clear to me, especially after the thoughtful discussion we had on Tuesday with our outside panel, that there is no set of options that lead to a quick and certain strategy on North Korea. While I believe that we should pursue and exhaust every diplomatic option to bring the North Korean regime to the negotiating table, those options are somewhat limited. China provides the lifeline for North Korea and China for its own national security interest seems unwilling to exert the type of pressure that is needed to convince the regime that denuclearization is the only path forward. Even if China were willing to exert that type of pressure, it seems that Kim Jong-un is so determined to pursue his nuclear program that he is willing to risk impoverishing and starving his own population to achieve his dream of becoming a nuclear-capable state. There are military options, but they are risky. A comprehensive strike on nuclear facilities may precipitate a catastrophic retaliation against the civilian population of Seoul or against our bases and service members in South Korea or Japan. A surgical strike, while less risky, may not deter the North Korean regime and runs the risk of emboldening Kim Jong-un. Complicating factors, of course, are the stockpile of chemical and biological weapons at his disposal, and road mobile missile launches spread across the countryside. North Korea's nuclear missile program is an immediate and grave national security threat. Admiral Harris, I ask that you tell us how you are preparing for every contingency on the peninsula. While North Korea poses an immediate national security threat, we must not lose sight of the potential long-term threat that China poses to the rules-based order in the Asia-Pacific region. Whether it be economic coercion of its smaller, more vulnerable neighbors or undermining the freedom of navigation that we all depend upon, China has not demonstrated a willingness to rise as a responsible global leader. Therefore, I believe it is critical that we empower and engage countries in Southeast Asia and South Asia to protect their own waterways and provide them with economic alternatives to maintain regional stability, preserve U.S. standing in Asia, and allow the economic growth and stability that has characterized the region for the last 50 years to continue. Again, thank you, Admiral, for your service, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral. Thank you, uh, Chairman McCain and Senator Reid and distinguished members. 
Uh, it is an honor for me to appear before this committee. There are many things to talk about since my last testimony 14 months ago. Uh, I regret that I'm not here with my testimony battle buddy, uh, General Vince Brooks, but I think you'll all agree that he's where he's needed most right now on the Korean Peninsula. Mr. Chairman, I request that my written posture statement be submitted for the record. As a PACOM commander, I have the extraordinary privilege of leading about 375,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and DOD civilians serving our nation uh, over half the globe. These dedicated patriots are doing an amazing job, and thanks to them, America remains the security partner of choice in the region. That's important because I believe that America's future and economic prosperity are inextricably linked to the Indo-Asia Pacific, a region that's poised at the strategic nexus where opportunity meets the four considerable challenges of North Korea, China, Russia, and ISIS. It's clear to me that ISIS is a threat that must be destroyed now, but as we eliminate ISIS in the Middle East and North Africa, some of the surviving fighters will likely repatriate to their home countries in the Indo-Asia Pacific. So we must continue to work with like-minded nations to eradicate ISIS before it grows in the PACOM area of responsibility. Then there's North Korea, which remains the most immediate threat uh, to the security of the United States and our allies in Japan and Korea. North Korea has vigorously pursued a strategic strike capability with nuclear tests and ballistic missile launches, which it claims are intended to target the United States, South Korea, Japan, and just earlier this week, Australia. Make no mistake, Kim Jong-un is making progress on his quest for nuclear weapons and a means to deliver them intercontinentally. All nations need to take this threat seriously because North Korea's missiles point in all directions. North Korea's capabilities are not yet an existential threat to the America, but if left unchecked, it will eventually match the capability uh, to hostile rhetoric. I know that there's some debate about North Korea's intent and the miniaturization advancements made by Pyongyang, and I won't add to that speculation. Regardless, my job is to provide military options to the president. And because PECOM must be ready to fight tonight, I must assume that Kim Jong-un's nuclear claims are true. I know his aspirations certainly are. That's why General Brooks and I are doing everything possible to defend the American homeland and our allies in the Republic of Korea and Japan. That's why the Rock us Alliance decided last July to deploy THAAD, the Terminal High Altitude Air De Area Defense System, uh, which will be operational in the coming days uh, and able to better defend South Korea against a growing North Korean threat. That's why the USS Carl Vinson Carrier Strike Group is back on patrol in Northeast Asia. That's why we must continue to debut America's newest and best military platforms in the Indo-Asia Pacific. That's why we want to continue to emphasize trilateral cooperation between the United States, South Korea, and Japan, a partnership with a purpose, if there ever was one. And that's why we continue to call on China to exert its considerable influence to stop Pyongyang's unprecedented weapons testing. While recent actions by Beijing are encouraging, the fact remains that China is as responsible for where North Korea is as North Korea itself. In confronting the reckless North Korean regime, it's critical that we're guided by a strong sense of resolve, both privately and publicly, both diplomatically and militarily. As President Trump and Secretary Mattis have made clear, all options are on the table. We want to bring Kim Jong-un to his senses and not to his knees. We're also challenged in the Indo-Asia Pacific by an aggressive China and a revanchist Russia. China continues a methodical strategy to control the South China Sea. I testified last year that China was militarizing this critical international waterway and the airspace above it by building air and naval bases on seven Chinese man-made islands in the disputed Spratlys. Despite subsequent Chinese assurances, at the highest levels, that they would not militarize these bases. Today, they have these facilities that support long-range weapons emplacements, fighter aircraft hangars, radar towers, and barracks for their troops. China's militarization of the South China Sea is real. I'm also not taking my eyes off of Russia, which just last week flew bomber missions near Alaska uh, on successive days for the first time since 2014. 
Russia continues to modernize its military and exercises its considerable conventional and nuclear forces in the Pacific. So despite the region's four significant challenges, since my last report to you, we've strengthened America's network of alliances and partnerships. Working with like-minded partners on shared security threats like North Korea and ISIS is a key component of our regional strategy. Our five bilateral defense treaty alliances, Australia, Japan, the Republic of Korea, the Philippines, and Thailand, anchor our joint force efforts in the Indo-Asia Pacific. We've also advanced important partnerships with India and Indonesia, Malaysia and New Zealand, Singapore and Sri Lanka, Vietnam, and others, all with a view toward reinforcing the rules-based security order that has helped underwrite peace and stability and prosperity throughout the region for decades. But there's more work to do. We must be ready to confront all challenges from a position of strength and with credible combat power. So I ask this committee to support continued investment to improve military capabilities. I need weapon systems of increased lethality, precision, speed, and range that are networked and cost-effective. And restricting ourselves with funding uncertainties reduces warfighting readiness, so I urge Congress to repeal sequestration and to approve the proposed Defense Department budget. Finally, I'd like to thank Chairman McCain and this committee for proposing and supporting the Asia-Pacific Stability Initiative. This effort will reassure our regional partners and send a strong signal to potential adversaries of our persistent commitment to the region. As always, I thank the Congress for your enduring support to the men and women of PACOM and to our families who care for us. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Sir. Thank you, Admiral, and thank you for the outstanding job and your outstanding leadership that you are exhibiting in these very difficult and uh, challenging times. Uh, Admiral, would, would you say that it's an accurate statement to say that the crisis on the Korean Peninsula now is reminiscent. It reminds one of a gradual Cuban Missile Crisis. Sir, I, I'll just say that I think the crisis on the Korean Peninsula is the is real. It's the worst I've seen. Uh, I'm not a student of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but what I know of it, it seems that we are uh, faced uh, with a threat and a leader who is intent uh, on achieving his goal uh, and uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 nuclear capability uh, against the United States. And that leader does not always behave in a rational fashion. Is that correct from you? That's, cor that's correct, sir. I, I believe that, uh, you know, uh, uh, to ascribe terms like rational or irrational to, 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 to Kim Jong-un is probably not helpful because he is what he is and we have to deal with the Kim Jong-un that is. Uh, and I believe that he, he does have some kind of uh, calculus uh, that ends up in decisions. So he takes information and makes a decision. Uh, and those decisions are often brutal uh, and the decisions uh, are there to keep uh, him and his family uh, in power in North Korea. And it's clear that his goal is a nuclear weapon and the means to deliver it to the United States of America. Is there any doubt in your mind? There is, there is no doubt in my mind, Chairman. And there is some question, given the difficulty of getting real reliable intelligence, as to how close he is to reaching that goal? Uh, there, there is, there is some uh, um, uh, doubt or questions within the intelligence com uh, community whether he has that capability today or whether he will soon have that capability. Uh, but I have to uh, assume that he has it, uh, as do my fellow combatant commanders, Laurie Robinson and uh, John Hyten. And we have to assume that the capability uh, is real. We know his intentions are. Uh, and he's moving toward them. He's also... So it's not a matter of whether, it's a matter of when. It, it is clearly a matter of when. Uh, as I said yesterday, um, uh, KJU is not a leader who's afraid to fail in public. And so, you know, I, I talked about Thomas Edison. He tried a thousand times before he got the light bulb to work. Uh, KJU is going to continue to try what until does, he gets his ICBMs to work. What does that do for us? It, it, and it, South Korea. I, I think the point that K, 
KGU's rhetoric, and he's threatened the United States and cities by name, and just this week he threatened Australia by name. Uh, I think his rhetoric, uh, if you were to project it on a graph, uh, it's going in one direction, and then his capability is approaching the line of his uh, capability is approaching the line <laughs> of his rhetoric, and where those, those lines cross, uh, I believe we are then at an inflection point, uh, and we wake up to a new world. What does Thad do for us? Thad uh, enables us uh, and uh, the, our South Korean allies to defend uh, South Korea or a big portion of South Korea against the threat from North Korea. Uh, it is aimed at North Korea, uh, the, the systems, uh, and it, it poses no threat but to China. Isn't it incredibly difficult to counter the 4,000 artillery pieces that the North Koreans have on the DMZ, which could attack a city of 26 million people? Uh, it, it is, sir, and that is not designed to counter uh, those kinds of uh, uh, basic weapons. And what is designed to do that? Anything? Uh, uh, we, we do not have uh, those kinds of weapons uh, that can counter those uh, rockets once they're launched. And they can launch, they have the capability of a launch of those rockets. At, at this very moment, they have that capability, Senator. What do you make of China's reaction to our emplacement of that, a purely defensive system? Does that give you an idea of China's real intentions about North Korea? Uh, I've said before, uh, Chairman, that I believe it's preposterous that China would criticize South Korea or the United States for in placing a purely defensive missile system against the North Korean threat uh, when the North Korean threat uh, owes its uh, survival, if you will, uh, to China. And, and I believe that China, rather than criticize the United States or South Korea for defending ourselves, should rather put that energy toward convincing uh, Kim Jong-un uh, to uh, stop his uh, nuclear ambitions. So we should be a bit skeptical about our ability to persuade the Chinese to break Kim Jong-un's quest for nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them? Uh, I, I have been skeptical up to, uh, up, up to the, the recent uh, uh, discussions between uh, President Trump and President Xi. So uh, I, I think that we're seeing more activity, uh, proactive, uh, positive activity from China uh, in this case uh, than we've seen in a long time. So I remain cautiously optimistic but and certainly would, hopeful. But you wouldn't rely on that? Uh, it's 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 too early to tell, sir. It's only been a, a month or so, and, and uh, but I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't rely on it at this I, time. I wouldn't bet my farm on it. We thank you, Admiral Senator Reid. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Admiral House. Uh, Admiral House, I understand yesterday that you, uh, in response to the uh, House questions, took responsibility for the miscommunication regarding the the Carl Vincent uh, Carrier Group. And uh, first of all, I commend you for standing up and being accountable and responsible. That's what uh, naval officers and do. But I think we've got to take significant steps to avoid such confusion in the future. It was quite detrimental, not only here, but as you know, in South Korea particularly, where there was a great deal of concern. And in some, some quarters, they felt that they had been uh, misled indeed. So I would urge you to... Uh, ensure that uh, such a miscoordination or miscommunication is, does not happen in the future. Yes, sir. Uh, I, again, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, I'm accountable and responsible and for the uh, uh, communications that came out of that, that evolution. Uh, I'm sorry that it happened, uh, and uh, uh, all I can say is that I will do better uh, in the future. Yes, sir. Uh, so. Let me uh, raise an issue that uh, is linked to our diplomacy. We are asking uh, China to take a much more assertive role in uh, urging North Koreans to cease and desist. Um, but uh, your view in terms of what concessions we should make, if any, to the Chinese to get them to cooperate, as both the chairman and I pointed out and you've pointed out, they, have, uh, they are posing significant 
uh, challenges to the, the rule of, of law in the Pacific, and we can't ignore that. So your comments on this issue? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Senator, I, I believe that, that uh, great powers uh, can walk and chew gum at the same time. And by that, I mean that uh, I think we can compliment and be grateful uh, to, to, for China's efforts in North Korea, uh, even as we criticize them, rightfully so, and hold them accountable uh, for actions that run counter to, to international rules and norms elsewhere, in, in this case, the South China Sea. I think we can do both, and we should do both. And I think China, uh, as a great power, can handle that criticism uh, on the one hand uh, while they're dealing uh, with this important, critical uh, international security issue on the other. Uh, thank you. Uh, obviously, we're trying to, to uh, approach the North Korean issue with a comprehensive uh, strategy, diplomacy, you know, military action, military preparedness, certainly. Uh, one aspect is information warfare. Uh, my sense, and I'm not the expert you are, but uh, Kim Jong-un is paranoid about his own people and, and what information they're getting. And do you think we're making a, a sufficient effort to um, get information into North Korea through various means uh, so that we can begin to uh, bypass the dear leader and go to the people, and that could create uh, pressures on him to forestall his nuclear ambitions? I believe we're making an effort. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, witting of the totality of that effort, uh, but I do believe that uh, uh, the people in North Korea revere Kim Jong Un, and I, and, I, and I believe that the idea that somehow we could, uh, or that somehow that they could rise up against Kim Jong Un if the situations the situation in North Korea became so dire. Uh, I think that might be a hollow hope. Uh, I believe that they, they consider him a god king, uh, and uh, they uh, truly revere him as their leader. Uh, and that, that's, that's just based on what I've read in the, the press and, and reports of reporters who see uh, the, the North Korean people start to cry and all of this uh, get emotional when he comes out on stage, and they, and they seem to be real tears. So uh, I think that, uh, that he has a hold on his people, that they're not going to rise up from, from beneath and topple him. I, you know, again, I think your perceptive is, uh, perception rather is, is, is uh, much closer to the situation on the ground. But anything we can do to either raise questions, I don't think they'll prompt an uprising immediately, not only questions among the population, but questions among the dear leader that uh, Kim Jong Un, that his people are being sort of influenced, or there might be elements within the country that are uh, thinking and embracing other ideas, could be uh, uh, some leverage. Uh, and, and I think we have to pursue aggressively these information operations. In my sense and, is when and I must agree with you there. So. Uh, just on one other I issue, and, and uh, you know, we have been uh, China has refused arbitration with the f with the, to acknowledge the decision of the arbitration course under the law of the sea with the Philippines, et cetera. We do have a successful example of Timor Leste and Australia are working together with respect, and um, that might be a model. To, maybe just rhetorically, that we could use uh, with the Chinese and see if we could move them towards a more cooperative aspect with the Philippines. I, Sir, just... I, I agree with you there. Thank there, you. There are, there are several good examples uh, in the, just in the Indo-Asia Pacific where arbitration has worked. Mm -hmm. uh, both parties have given a little and gotten a lot, uh, and the overall uh, picture in the, in the region has been one of increased stability uh, rather than uh, decreased stability. Thank you very much, Admiral. Yeah. Admiral, I think these, um, what's happened in the last few days has served as a wake-up call to the American people. Of course, we had our, our hearing Tuesday with some four pretty smart people that came to the same conclusion. That we have you today, and of course we have a, uh, what happened yesterday at the White House as well as uh, other uh, places in, in, the, in the House. Uh, but we actually talked about this, and it's been obvious to those of us at, the, at this table 
that over a period of time, North Korea has, going all the way arguably back to the Scud B uh, times of the middle 70s, uh, progressing up to the Nodong and the Taipo Dong 1 and Taipo Dong 2, and then ultimately coming up to the statement that he makes that declares that uh, North Korea, this is Kim Jong Un, declares that it's at his final, quote, final stages in preparations to test an intercontinental ballistic missile. So I think people now realize that it's, uh, it, it is that imminent threat, and, and they, they really haven't. I know that you deal with in military circles, and you're dealing with people who know what threat is, but those of us around this table are dealing with the general public, many of whom do not understand that. So we had um, the hearing on Tuesday. Uh, they agreed that North Korea currently represents the single most imminent, they use imminent threat. Um, uh, Victor Cha testified, and this was his quote, he said the pace of North Korea's development shows that it wants to be able not just to field one missile that could reach the United States, but a whole slew of them. And the panel all agreed on that. So we're getting into really talking about serious things here. You just now, in response to a question or a comment by the chairman, said that it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. So we know and I think it's our job, and it's incumbent upon the military as well as us to let the American people know the nature of the threat that's out there. Now, last year, Senator Rounds and I led a, a group uh, to uh, your area, and we talked about uh, some of the things that were taking place at that time. And uh, we came back and we had that hearing that you referred to. In the hearing, you were asked the question, as to what do you, what are your needs there in terms of resourcing yourself adequately to meet the threats? Let's keep in mind that was a year ago, and with the threats is totally it been enhanced since that time. What would those needs be uh, today, as opposed to what we thought they were a year ago? Sir, uh, last year uh, uh, I commented that I had the forces to fight tonight to respond tonight uh, to any threat from North Korea or anywhere else for that matter, and I still believe that today. I have the forces uh, in place to fight tonight if necessary. Uh, what I'm concerned about are those follow-on forces uh, and how those, and uh, the forces themselves, and also how those follow-on forces would get to the region in terms of airlift and sea lift. So I'm, I'm worried about that. I'm also worried about uh, 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 Things like small diameter um, bombs and other kinds of munitions, uh, anti-air warfare uh, weapons for our fighter aircraft, uh, adequate numbers of AIM-9D and AIM-120 uh, uh, missiles. Uh, I worry about the shortage of anti-ship missiles, uh, and whether it's uh, long-range anti-surface missiles, uh, with more Tomahawk or whatever, but a, a, a long-range uh, any anti-surface missile. Uh, I would like to see uh, a fifth SSN in Guam, but more than the fifth SSN in Guam, uh, our nation is facing uh, a significant uh, shortage uh, and in terms of uh, submarine numbers. Yeah. So, I, I, so, so as a combatant commander, for example, I only get 50 percent uh, of the submarines that I think I need, but that's based on a 52 submarine force, and by the end of the 2020s, the Navy projects that summary force, attack summary force, will go down to 42. So my requirements won't go down, but the, uh, the, the pool from which uh, they'll be sourced is going to drop dramatically. So I worry about that significantly uh, as I look at the threat from North Korea, potential threat from China, uh, and from Russia. Yeah, and we're going to be depending on you to advise us in, in not generalities, but as you're getting into right now, priorities right. and the, the needs that you have, and we will depend on that. I am also uh, encouraged that our allies are more dependable than uh, what they have been in the past, and is it your impression that they see this as the threat that's out there uh, as we do, and that, does this open the door for maybe even more allies coming in our direction? Uh, I, I believe it does, and, and, and if, if we define allies, or, uh, you know, as partners like, like you're talking, you know, we only have five treaty, uh, defense treaty allies uh, in the world, and they're all in the Indo-Asia Pacific. We have other countries that are, uh, that are close to us, 
that are partners with us. Singapore comes to mind, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, mm -hmm. India, Vietnam. Uh, these are countries that I think uh, are uh, uh, seek the United States as a security partner of choice. Yeah, well, I appreciate that very much. Now, my time has expired, but I'd like to just ask one more question. You made the statement we should cease to be cautious about the language we use to describe these activities. Can you be, define that a little bit for us? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure in what context uh, you're referring Okay, to. that was a quote, and I'll do that for the record and give you the context, okay. I, because it's something that a lot of us didn't understand. Yes, sir. Thank you, you very bet. much. Admiral, thank you for your service, and you uh, are certainly in the center of the action. Um, let me just reiterate here what you've said. You, you said that the Korean leader is intent on accomplishing his goals as a nuclearized nation. His goal is a nuclear warhead. These are my words, but I think it's what you meant. Married to an ICBM that would have the capability of getting to the U.S. And you said it's not, a, in your opinion, not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Is that a correct interpretation of what you've said? It, it is correct, sir. Okay. And you also uh, offered your opinion that you would not bet that China can basically de deter the DPRK. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, to be clear, uh, I felt uh, uh, in the past that China, uh, though has, though it had the, or has the capability uh, to uh, influence and affect North Korean behavior uh, for a number of reasons, it had chosen not to exert the full range of its influence. Uh, and I think we're in a different place now. Uh, I think the jury's out. It's early days. Uh, we'll have to see uh, if China has changed its view of uh, its willingness uh, to uh, influence KGU. Based on their previous activity, there's no indication that you think that that's going to occur although you're hopeful. Well, right, sir. I mean, past performance is no indicator of future productivity. So uh, up to, up to uh, a month or two ago, I would agree with that statement completely. Um, after all, I made the statement. So, uh, but uh, from a month ago forward, I mean, we're seeing uh, some positive uh, behavior from, from China, and I'm encouraged by that. So I, I think we should let, the, uh, let this thing play out a little bit and see where it goes. Now, part of that, though, Kim Jong-un and, and the North Korean regime, uh, you know, they can't do something pre precipitative uh, in the intervening period uh, to, to uh, test us. So we have to be careful and sensitive to that as well. Precisely. So up to this point, has China done anything that would give you uh, an indication that they are going to be helpful to the U.S. in getting... Uh, the leader to back off of his intent to nuclearize uh, an ICBM? Sir, I, I, I don't know for a fact what China has done in the last uh, month or so. Uh, I know that they uh, are active in, in, uh, in uh, uh, working the problem set, but I don't know the specifics of what they've done. Uh, uh, all, all I see are the... Are the are the activities that Kim Jong-un has done, uh, you know, in the last uh, month or so. And that is still on his march to nuclearize ICBM. Uh, I, I think it is, though in the last month he has not tested a, a nuclear weapon. Uh, so he's tested five this century, and, and uh, he hasn't tested a sixth. Uh, he has not launched an ICBM in the last month. Uh, or ever, so I don't know if 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 that is if there's a cause and effect or whether it just didn't fit his schedule. Right. So uh, I, I, again, uh, it's early days on this, so I, I think we would be best served uh, to see if this uh, has um, a positive outcome or not, and let President Xi and uh, 
uh, you know, work, work this issue uh, as he and the president said he agreed they would. Sure. Uh, but if China doesn't deter him, there's only one deterrence left, and that's the U.S. Uh, kinetic action. Is that what it looks like? Uh, I, I, I don't want to say that there's only that uh, option left. Uh, I, I think if China's efforts fails, then we're back to where we were, uh, 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 status quo ante, if you will, to try to throw some Latin in there. Uh, and, and, and at that point, and then as the president has said, all options are on the table. And, and I think he means just that, all options are on the table. So my job in, in, in that framework uh, is to provide military options, but there are other options, I'm, I'm sure, and, and, uh, uh, and, and, I, and I would leave it to those experts to come up with those options. But my options are hard power options. And your hard power options, you need additional materiel. Uh, I, I, I need additional materiel uh, in the long run. But that's not to suggest that the hard power options that the U.S. military can provide the president would not be effective tonight, and they would be effective tonight if called upon to execute them. Um, final question. There was a uh, report in the Washington Post, I think it was David Ignatius, uh, several weeks ago, in essence, saying that uh, be the failures of the uh, North Korean launches uh, are directly attributable to the U.S. Uh, is that anything that you want to talk about here? Uh, no, sir. It's not anything I want to talk about here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Harris, thank you for being here. As PACOM commander, uh, did you participate in... Um, uh, authoring the 2016 force structure assessment? Uh, I, I participated in, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, the run-up to that. Okay. Right. Well, um, the, uh, the force structure assessment calls, called for a 355 ship Navy, and, and in that regard, I want to follow up on a, a line of questioning uh, from Senator Inhofe and, and drill down on that. Actually, what the, what the FSA said is that in a perfect world unconstrained by the budget, the requirement is 653 ships um, fleet-wide, uh, but by accepting risk and uh, understanding the, the financial restrictions that we have, um, the requirement is 355 ships. Now, I want to help uh, you get the ships you need, and I, I want to help uh, the Navy get the ships they need, and, and so when, when when I'm told 355 ships is a requirement, um, I, I believe that. Now, you mentioned to uh, Senator Inhofe that you don't have enough submarines. You also mentioned some ammunition there, but let's talk about ships. Uh, how many submarines do you have now, and how many do you need? Sir, I, I, I prefer to give you those in a different setting on, on okay, the precise well, numbers. Uh, other than, but I will say that I only have half. I only get half of what I need. Okay. So I have a stated requirement that's based on based on steady state things that we do with our submarines today, and then I have a requirement that's based on war fighting. So on in our war plans, they say uh, these war plans uh, state a requirement for. Uh, X number of submarines in Y number of days. So those are two kinds of metrics. So you got uh, a, a number of submarines that you need uh, to fight the war if it happens, and then you've got a number of submarines that I need today to do the day-to-day -day operations uh, in the region. And in today's numbers, I'm, I get about half of what my formally stated requirement is. You get half of 52. Uh, no, sir. I get half of my my requirement. The 52 is the total number of submarines that the Navy attack submarines that the Navy has. So my my number of requirements is is irrespective of the number of submarines the Navy has. But the number of submarines that I get 
are based on the number of submarines the Navy has. Well, but it's not just me. It's all the combatant commanders have these requirements. Central Command, UCOM, uh, and, and every other comm. Well, let me just ask you, um, if the Navy gets its 355 ships and you get your portion of it, what will you be capable of doing that you can't do now? Um, uh, uh, the, the, the first thing is my steady state requirements uh, in order to do the things that we do today uh, in this, uh, uh, in the climate that we're in, uh, will be much better. My fight tonight forces that I have to have ready to uh, respond to a North Korean aggression or Chinese coercion or, or, or something like that. Those forces will be f more robust. Most importantly, the follow-on and surge forces uh, will be available. Uh, on shorter timelines. So today, those follow-on forces uh, are delayed by any number of reasons, uh, and that delay is felt in terms of increased risk, longer timelines, and increased deaths of Americans. Uh, and if I have th the, the number of ships that the Navy is asking for and the number of, of jets that the Air Force is asking for and on and on, uh, then both my ready-to-fight tonight forces will be richer, the timelines to get follow-on forces will be shortened, uh, and, the, and the, the density of those follow-on forces will be thicker. Well, let me just say, I, I think at, at some point it's going to be helpful to this committee if, you, if you're a little more specific uh, about those details. Let me just follow up on something that uh, Chairman McCain asked about. Um, the threats that, that we have from North Korea now, the, there's an intercontinental ballistic missile. We, there's a better chance than not that we could shoot that down if that happened. Um, there are these 4,000 um, short-range missiles, and your testimony is that there, there is essentially no defense from the South for those right. short-range missiles, and those are missiles. Those are mostly the artillery. Artillery, okay, artillery. And so you know, and there's no defense. Right. I mean, you're, you're trying to shoot down an artillery round. Okay. Right. And and then the chairman asked you, and I don't think I, I, I understood the answer. What does Thad get us? Thad uh, allows us uh, an intercept capability to shoot down high uh, at the at the uh, at the high altitude level. Uh, ballistic missiles that go from North Korea to South Korea. It's a terminal high altitude area defense system aimed at ballistic missiles uh, from North Korea against South Korea. So, you know, that's a short distance uh, across the, uh, the earth, but it, 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 the missiles have to, it, the missiles have a high uh, atmospheric um, uh, uh, altitude. And so that's what that gives you. So you know, that is, is part of a, of a, of a system you know, that the, that the South Koreans have, uh, Thad, uh, they have Patriot, uh, and they have uh, 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 the, the like. So that's what those systems are designed for, to give a, a, an umbrella, if you will, to protect South Korea. It seems to me the chairman's point uh, is, is the dramatic point, and, and that is that there's this short-range artillery, and we have no defense right. should North Korea decide to unleash those. Right. And, and I think we should develop that capability. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Admiral Harris. Thank you very much for your service to the country and for your leadership at this challenging time. Um, one of the things that we heard from a panel of private sector but some former officials on North Korea on Tuesday was that the only um, the only impetus to encourage China to engage with North Korea in the way that we would like in order to help us get them to back down on their nuclear program would be if we um, initiated much more extensive sanctions on China with respect to their financial system or if they believe that there was imminent threat of war on the Korean Peninsula do you think that's an accurate analysis based on your experience with China and the region? Uh, Senator, I, I think it is an accurate analysis. Uh, I, I think there is some room uh, in the sanctions regime 
but there's not a lot left in there, but there are some, and we should apply all of those that we can before uh, we're left with only the other choice. And again, to be clear, they were suggesting that the sanctions should be on China um, on their financial system. There, there, are, there are many, there are some areas in the sanctions regime that we have not yet explored, and, and I think we should explore those before we do the kinetics. Thank you. And everyone has acknowledged, obviously, that North Korea is um, working towards a nuclear weapon, and that the, that's one of the things that's changed in North Korea. Have we seen uh, an escalation of rhetoric from Kim Jong-un, or uh, are we seeing very much the same kinds of rhetoric, but we're paying more attention to it today no, because I, I, of the I, nuclear threat? I think we're seeing uh, increased rhetoric. I mean, just this week, he threatened uh, Australia. Uh, this week, he said he was going to shoot out, uh, sink the Carl Benson uh, with a single shot, which is, you know, ridiculous, but he said it. And so he is increasing his rhetoric. At the same time, uh, he's continuing his aggressive uh, weapons development. So uh, I think they're both going hand in hand. He had that parade uh, last week, which showed off all the weapons systems and stuff like that. Uh, so I think all of that uh, in combination uh, lets me know, uh, and should let us all know, that he is intent uh, on his objective, uh, and he's moving uh, toward that objective apace. And, and how much of a concern is it that at a time when we're trying to get China to work with us on North Korea, we're also very concerned about what they're doing in the South China Sea, their um, increasing effort to expand control of the seas in Southeast Asia? How much of a a difficulty does that present for us as we're well, trying to work I, with them? As, as I said earlier, I, I, I don't think that it poses too much of a difficulty for a nation like the United States. You know, we should be able to, to uh, uh, compliment and applaud China's efforts on the one hand and then be willing to criticize them for the, the bad things they do on the other. And, and I think from China's perspective, uh, they can receive that criticism and continue to do the thing that benefits not just us, but benefits them. I mean, uh, uh, a nuclear North Korea uh, or the, uh, the U.S. response to a nuclear North Korea, uh, as you said, affects China almost as much as it would affect North Korea. So uh, I think it's in their best interest to do this and, uh, you know, take, uh, listen to the, what the international community, not just the United States, but the international community is saying about this. So... I appreciate that you've taken responsibility for the Carl Benson, and I understand as the commander you, you would do that. Um, but how concerned, as we're thinking about the messages that we send to North Korea, to China, to both our allies and enemies, how concerned should we be about that kind of a mixed message? And yesterday, one of the things that obviously got a lot of attention was the briefing at the White House of all of the senators, which I assume North Korea watched very closely, as did most people. So how, how should we think about being consistent about the messages that we're sending to, um, to the region? Yeah, and, and I, I agree with you. I, I think we should be consistent. Uh, the messaging was my fault, not, not simply because I'm the combatant commander, but it was my fault, uh, and so I, 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 I take the responsibility for it. What I said at the time was that we were going to pull the Carl Vinson out of Singapore. We were going to truncate the exercise, the follow-on exercise that it was going to have uh, with Australia, cancel the Australian port visit, and then send it to Northeast Asia. Uh, I didn't specify time in there. Uh, the, 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 there was a... Um, uh, a lot of press reporting on that that implied uh, that the, it was now, now, now. And I could have uh, stepped in and, and corrected that, and I did not. And I, I, I feel responsible for that, and I'm, and I'm remiss for not doing that. But that's all on me. Uh, the messaging on, on this comes out of Pacific Command. So I'm, I'm, I regret that it happened. Uh, I'll try to do better, but it's, it is on me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Admiral Harris, for being here today. 
Some believe that our nuclear forces exist only to deter nuclear attack on the homeland here in the United States, but I think the recent events on the Korean Peninsula demonstrate the value of our extended deterrence commitments and the role that our nuclear forces play in assuring our allies of our resolve as well. Can you talk about the value that our allies place on our nuclear umbrella and the importance of modernizing our nuclear forces so that we can continue to deter our adversaries and also to reassure our allies? Yeah, uh, ma'am, I, I think that our, our allies are as dependent on our nuclear umbrella as we are. Uh, and I think the, uh, the, the, the shows of force that we provide uh, against our adversaries are important. We have the USS Michigan, a guided missile SSGN. It's not a, a ballistic missile deterrent, but it's a guided missile uh, uh, submarine. Uh, is in Busan, South Korea right now. And I think that sends a powerful signal of solidarity with our South Korean ally. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it shows uh, the North Koreans uh, that we are serious uh, about the defense commitment, our defense commitment to our ally uh, on the peninsula. Uh, I think that uh, the uh, modernization, the modernizing of our nuclear deterrent uh, is absolutely critical to our nation for our survival. And that means uh, the follow-on um, uh, Ohio-class submarines, that means the, the long-range strike bomber and an upgraded uh, ground-based uh, 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 ICBMs. And I think the three together, the triad, uh, is a proven success story. We shouldn't uh, experiment uh, with, with some other formula. It has worked so far, uh, and uh, I think it will work well into the future. But we must commit as a nation to modernizing that for us. Thank you, sir. Um, if we're going to have that message of deterrence and assurance, we, uh, we need to stick to that modernization plan then, correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, last year, General Scaparati, who was then the commander of the United States forces in Korea, he stated that the ISR was his top readiness challenge. And he said, quote, the United States forces Korea requires increased multidiscipline, persistent ISR capabilities to maintain situational awareness and provide adequate decision space for the USFK, PACOM, and national senior leaders. Can you discuss how the ISR enables your operations in PACOM region and also in relation to the Korean Peninsula specifically? Yes, ma'am, and, and I'll try to uh, stay on the right side of the classification here without getting into too many specifics. But uh, ISR, Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance, uh, is the, the term that we apply to our ability to watch our adversaries. And, and we want to watch them all the time. Uh, but there's not enough ISR to go around to meet all of the requirements of all of the combatant commanders. So I, I, I've stated my requirements. This is like the submarine discussion. Central Command, who's fighting the fight today uh, in the Middle East, AFRICOM and, and North Africa and so on, they have their requirements for ISR also. So it comes out of a pool. Uh, and, 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 uh, and all the services uh, contribute to, 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 to the pool in different ways. Um, and so I don't have what I need. I don't have the ability to persistently watch uh, my adversaries all over the Indo-Asia Pacific, over half the globe, 24-7. Uh, and, and I need it 24-7. I need it um, uh, in whatever 60 times uh, uh, 24 hours is. I need it that minute by minute. Uh, and, and I don't have that. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's the, what General Scaparotti was getting at with persistent ISR. And I'm convinced that today, uh, even though he's the European command commander, uh, he would like more ISR as well. Can you give us some kind of idea on what percentage of, of those requirements you have fulfilled? Do uh, you have half? Do you have no, two-thirds? No, have... I, I probably have a tenth of my requirements are fulfilled. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Uh... Chairman, and uh, thank you, Admiral Harris, for your uh, testimony here today. Admiral Harris, uh, you referenced uh, in your written testimony that nine out of ten uh, megacities uh, in the world are in the Pacific Command's area of responsibility, and certainly given our conversation here today, Seoul is uh, in the front and center of, uh, of uh, what we're talking about. 
It is my understanding uh, that the number of uh, megacities in the world is, is expected to expand in the coming years, uh, and I expect that growth will continue in the uh, Indo-Asian Pacific uh, theater as well. And I'm concerned, uh, as well as I know a number of other folks, uh, that our military isn't adequately prepared in oper for operations in megacities, uh, whether it's uh, to fight or is uh, to assist in humanitarian assistance or disaster relief uh, uh, missions. So I'd like your opinion, Admiral, on, uh, on how we should conduct training, and do you believe that additional training, particularly with the Army and Marine Corps, uh, should focus on operations within megacities? Thanks, sir. And, and just to be clear, in that nine of ten, I stole a city from Joe Votel. Yeah. One of those cities is Karachi, Pakistan, which is in right. his AOR, but right next to mine. Right. So um, uh, I, uh, I believe the Army and the Marine Corps are getting after this issue of fighting in heavily urban terrains. Uh, and and uh, 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 I believe that, that uh, they need to continue to do that for the reasons you've outlined, but also uh, we're working with our allies and friends in the region to improve their capability uh, at the same time that we work to improve our capability uh, to, to fight in those dense urban environments. Edward House, uh, as, uh, as you know, China's uh, One Belt, One Road strategy seeks to secure China's control over its continental and maritime interests uh, with the hopes of uh, dominating Eurasia and exploiting natural resources for future economic gains. Such designs uh, place the country at odds uh, with the United States, but also nations like uh, Japan and, and India. And currently, China's economy and budget is four times greater than those uh, of India. I want to talk a little bit about India and its importance to us. However, uh, India is uh, an ambitious and growing country, both in population and its economy. China and India naturally have competing interests at stake on the continent and adjoining maritime domain. India has expressed concerns over China's recent expansion into the South China Sea and perceived strategic goals in our region. Also, given the fact that uh, India is a democracy, certainly shares many values uh, with us uh, here in the United States. I'd be curious as to how you view India's role in the future in the Indo-Pacific region and what we should be doing uh, to strengthen that relationship and if there's anything in particular uh, that you would like to see expanded so that we can work more closely with uh, our friends in India. Thanks, sir. Uh, I, I've made India a formal line of effort at Pacific Command because I believe it represents a tremendous opportunity for the United States writ large and for PACOM uh, in particular in, in the mill-to-mill -mill space. Uh, we share uh, 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 d democratic values with India. We're the world's two largest democracies. Uh, we share cultural, cultural values. Uh, with Indian Americans uh, that, that live and work uh, and lead in, in our country. Uh, and I think that the, on the, in the mill-to-mill -mill space, uh, we're, we're in a very good place and getting better. Uh, India is purchasing uh, uh, a lot of American equipment. Uh, the world's second largest C-17 fleet, for example, is Indian. Uh, the, the Indians have P-8 uh, Poseidon aircraft. Uh, uh, U.S. helicopters, uh, uh, howitzers, and, and on and on. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there, uh, and I think we should continue to work that. We are heavily involved, when I say we, the Navy is heavily involved in uh, working with the Indians on the development of their aircraft carrier, their indigenous uh, aircraft carrier. And that's an exciting program. Uh, and I think that India's uh, geostrategic interests align perfectly with ours in, in terms of, of being concerned about China and in, in, in terms of uh, 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 the interaction or the intersection, rather, of, of China and India, uh, including along their long uh, uh, land border, but especially in the Indian Ocean, especially in the approaches to the Indian Ocean, the Andaman Islands and the like. So uh, I welcome uh, uh, and improve relationship with India. They've invited me twice in the last two years to speak at their Rizina dialogue, uh, which, which I've accepted, uh, and uh, I want to continue to improve uh, and grow the relationship between our two countries. Right. Thank you, Admiral. Admiral, welcome back, and thanks to you and all the men and women you lead in Pacific Command. I want to talk today about relative force 
uh, strength of missile forces in the Indo-Pacific, uh, given the vast distances in that theater. Missiles are a critical component of any country's security, including ours. Um, how many of China's land-based missile forces uh, do you estimate have a range of 500 to 5,500 kilometers? Uh, in, a, in an unclassified uh, venue, Senator, uh, over 90 percent. Over 90 percent fall in that range. And how many uh, missiles do you have uh, that fall in that range? I have none, sir. That you have none? Right. Why do you have none? Uh, be, um, because that range, 500 to 5,500 kilometers, uh, is defined uh, in the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty, which prohibits uh, nuclear and cruise uh, missiles uh, and ICBMs, or uh, nuclear and conventional cruise and ICBMs, uh, or ballistic missiles in that range. Uh, okay. and, uh, and we adhere to the INF Treaty uh, relig religiously, as we should. It's a treaty that we signed on for. Uh, China is not a signatory to the treaty, so they're not obliged to follow that treaty. And we can't legitimately, in my opinion, criticize China for developing weapons uh, that contravene the treaty because they, they did not sign on to it. Because the, the only two parties to the treaty are Russia and the United States. That's correct. And, and there are some successor states from the Soviet Union that, that the treaty applies. But it's really us and Russia are the signatories to the treaty. Uh, General Selva just testified uh, uh, recently that, China, that Russia rather has violated uh, the treaty in the conventional sense and for, with a conventional cruise missile. And so at the end of the day, what you have is uh, you have a treaty that binds theoretically two countries, one of which violates it without being held to account. The other uh, uh, adheres to it rigidly as we should, as it should. And then all the other countries in the world are not obliged to follow the treaty, and they don't. And those countries that are of concern, of course, are China and my region uh, and Iran uh, in, in Joe Votels. Well, since you mentioned General Selva's uh, testimony, I think this is uh, what you're referring to. He spoke to the House Armed Services Committee last month in which he said, the Russians have deployed a land-based cruise missile that violates the spirit and intent of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, and they do not intend to return to compliance. Is that what you were referring to? Uh, it was, sir. And you agree with that assessment? I do. And the INF Treaty was originally um, um, reached between the United States and the Soviet Union after the buildup of first Soviet forces in the late 70s and then our own forces, uh, along with NATO in 1983. Uh, and so it was geared primarily towards the European theater. Is that correct? Uh, it, it, it was geared toward the Soviet Union, uh, Senator, in a bipolar world. You know, this was at the height of the Cold War, uh, and, and now we're in a multipolar world where, where we have a lot of countries that are developing these weapons, including China, that I worry about. And I worry about their DF-21 and DF-26 missile programs, their anti-carrier ballistic missile programs, if you will. Uh, INF doesn't, doesn't address uh, 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 missiles launched from ships or airplanes, uh, but it, it focuses on those land-based uh, systems. Uh, uh, I think there's goodness in the INF treaty. Uh, anything you can do to uh, limit nuclear weapons writ large is, 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 a, is a general good, probably. Uh, but the, the aspects of the INF treaty that limit uh, our ability to counter uh, 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 Chinese and other countries' uh, cruise missiles, land-based missiles, I think uh, is problematic. And as you say, since the United States and Russia are the only two parties to the treaty, and you and General Selva and several other U.S. government officials have said that Russia is violating the treaty, that means the United States is the only country in the world, the only country in the world, that unilaterally refuses to build missiles that have a range of 500 to 5,500 kilometers. That is correct. Uh, do you think that we should consider renegotiating or withdrawing uh, from the treaty or declaring yeah, Russia I, a material I, breach? I, I, I would never advocate unilateral withdrawing for the treaty, from the treaty uh, because of the, the, the nuclear uh, uh, limitation part of it. But I, I do think we should look at renegotiating the treaty. We should consider that because, as you say, there's only two countries that signed on to it. And one of them doesn't follow it, and 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 so uh, you know that 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 becomes a unilateral uh, uh, limitation on us. So so one final question. Then there's three scenarios. 
One is Russia comes back into compliance, so the United States and Russia comply. Two is we somehow withdraw from or abrogate or declare Russia a material breach, so we are no longer unilaterally um, controlled. Or we continue the status quo, where we unilaterally are the only country that develops, uh, that refuses to develop those missiles. Surely, whatever you think between one and two, we can't accept three going forward, can we? All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the chairman, Senator Warren, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for being here, Admiral Harris. In your posture statement last year, you described the Asia-Pacific rebalance as, quote, a strategic whole of government effort that guides and reinforces our military efforts, integrating with diplomatic, political, and economic initiatives. You still agree with that statement, Admiral? Uh, I, I, I do, ma'am. Uh, I, I, but, I, I, uh, you know, we've... We labeled it the rebalance in the previous administration, and in the early days of the previous administration, we labeled it the pivot. Yes. Uh, I, I think the labeling of whatever it is we do is less important than the whatever it is we do. And that's actually the part I wanted to focus on, because I, I agree with you on this. And I just have a simple question right here, and that is whether or not funding cuts to agencies that conduct diplomacy and development and perform other civilian functions would make your job easier or more difficult? Uh, I, I believe it would make it uh, more difficult. I'm reminded of, of uh, what uh, uh, f uh, famous French Foreign Minister Talleyrand said, the, the, the head of the French Army, Marshal Ney. He said, when my profession fails, yours must come to the rescue. Uh, I think that uh, it, it's a, we're, in, we're not in a good place if we're that uh, bifurcated. But also, uh, I believe that uh, if the State Department fails earlier because of funding, then we'll have to, quote, unquote, come to the rescue sooner. Yeah. And I'd rather, you know, push that off to the right rather than bring it to the left. Yeah, that's a, that's a very powerful point. I just want to note for the record that the Trump administration in its budget blueprint calls for about a 29 percent cut to the State Department and significant cuts to other agencies with international responsibilities. Obviously, there is a strong military component uh, to the Asia-Pacific and keeping us safe there, but as you say, it takes a lot more in this vital region uh, to keep us safe. So I want to shift, if I can, to North Korea. Uh, we are dealing here with a real threat from a dangerous, unstable, nuclear-armed state. And despite tough sanctions, North Korea continues to be provocative. I'm concerned that this is a brewing crisis that would escalate without warning. We went over the White House yesterday, and the administration said again that the time for strategic patience is over. Now, I, I think it's still not clear precisely what their new strategy is. By all accounts, North Korea is continuing its efforts to develop a nuclear-armed interballistic missile system that could reach the continental U.S. coastline. And in recent days, administration officials have talked about shooting down a North Korean ballistic, ballistic missile test. So, Admiral, could you talk a little bit about the strategic considerations that we must take into account before taking such an action, what are the upsides and downsides to shooting down one of their test missiles here? Well, it, it, there, there's a capability issue. There's a there's a, you know, a geometry issue of where that missile is is going, uh, and and all of that. So, uh, if, if they're launching a test missile that we think is going to land in Korea or Japan, then I think we're obligated to to do what we can. To uh, I understand that, but. But just shooting down a test missile in general. You know, as, as I understand it, what I've been trying to read about this, experts on North Korea's war plans say that Kim Jong-un would likely respond to U.S. military action with massive escalation against South Korea, Japan, perhaps even the United States, if we shot down a test missile. So I'm just asking... Do you agree with that assessment? And if so, how is it that the administration should take this dynamic into account as it formulates its well, North Korea you know, policy? A, 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 a lot of what you're asking, Senator, is being deliberated in the administration now. And, and you know, I, I, I'm, I'm in a difficult position when asked to, um, to comment on ongoing 
uh, process deliberations. So I'm going to defer on that. But I will say that there are, there are uh, if, if we uh, don't uh, maintain credible combat power to, to confront Kim Jong-un's testing and his development uh, goals, then we're going to be in a position to be blackmailed by KJU. And I think that's probably a worse, case, worse place to be. And I, and I think that, that we'll all agree that, that everything that's been done up to this point has not worked in deterring Kim Jong-un. So all of the, the military uh, capabilities that we have, all of our alliance is and, and all of that, have not deterred Kim Jong-un's desires to achieve a nuclear weapon that can reach the United States. So we must stop that somehow. Well, and it, so those options are, are, I think, are on the table. All of those options are on the table. The, the somehow, though, is the question, and I see that I'm out of time, so I'm, I'm going to quit here and we can right. continue this conversation later. But that's precisely the question we're trying to ask about and why it is that I'm asking the question about what the upsides and downsides are if we take action directly on one of these testing missiles, right. whether or not it escalates. And this gives him provocation to invade South Korea, to bomb Japan, well, I, otherwise. And so, it, yeah, I, 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 I think that he has the, you know, he, he can he can uh, manufacture whatever provocation he wants to to attack South Korea or Japan or us. You know, I, I, I think that the 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 manufacturer of provocations uh, it resides with him. I I, I, I appreciate that. But I'm, I have to say on this one, Admiral, I think that we need the administration to be clearer about what they have in mind here. You rightly say this is under discussion, but what that means to me at this point is that no one knows exactly what it is that we plan to do here. And if no one knows here in the United States, if the American people don't know, if Kim Jong-un doesn't have some idea of what the response will be if he continues this testing... I think, it's, I think it's difficult for it to have any kind of deterrent effect. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on behalf of Chairman McCain, Senator Arnold, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Admiral, thank you very much for being here today. I know the region is in a really precarious um, time and situation, but uh, we do appreciate you taking time out to be with us. In a February speech, you warned the audience of the perils of linear thinking, saying instead that we need to think exponentially in order to develop strategies and technologies that give us an asymmetric advantage over regional threats. And I absolutely 100% agree with you. As chair of the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee, I'm very, very frustrated with the oftentimes slow and very, very expensive nature of our defense acquisitions. Um, you've even said this. Uh, you said that Lady Gaga was able to use over 300 drones uh, during her Super Bowl halftime show. And why is it that she has that technological advantage and we can't capitalize on that? Um, how important is it that we are able to rapidly develop things like directed energy weapons and swarming micro drones? And more importantly, if we had these technologies today, would we have um, more and better options in order to manage threats that are posed by North Korea and China? Yeah, so so I, I think, Senator, that innovation uh, is, is, in general, is one of those asymmetric advantages that America enjoys over every adversary. Uh, but uh, we're, we're, in a, we're in a place now where our adversaries recognize that, and they're trying to close that innovation gap. Mm -hmm. And they do it in a number of ways. Uh, they send their best and brightest students to American universities, uh, and then they get educated here, and they go back home, and they carry that knowledge back to them. Uh, they also do it illegally. They steal our, our, our secrets. They steal our industrial uh, uh, processes, uh, and they shorten their uh, uh, acquisition timelines dramatically. So they can feel things uh, at a rate faster than we can. Uh, and we're often encumbered, um, rightly so, uh, by law, regulation, and policy. Uh, and uh, I, I think that we should look at trying to figure out how to shorten uh, that process. You know, the law is important, obviously. The regulations are important. Policy is important. But when the three in combination uh, uh, 
um, uh, allow us to be overtaken uh, in technological development by those countries that would do us harm, uh, I think we should step back and look at that and ask ourselves, uh, is this the right way forward? Uh, I'm, I'm pleased with things like uh, the, uh, the DIUX effort uh, undergoing that's, uh, that's been undertaken by the department, uh, the SCO effort, the Special Capabilities Office uh, that resides in OSD to try to go flash to bang quicker uh, and things like that. Thank you, and I, I do agree. I think it's important that we are able to move rapidly, and you are absolutely correct about the regulations and the laws. Great, They're, they were there for a purpose, but we do have to go back and, I think, uh, scrutinize mm -hmm. some of those regulations to make sure that we're able to move as, as rapidly as some of our near-peer competitors, or even those that are not near-peer competitors um, with off-the-shelf technology. Uh, you mentioned ISIS uh, in some of your comments, and in your testimony, of course, active engagement between the United States and our partner countries is very critical to maintaining the stability in that region, not just with those state actors like uh, North Korea, but also with partners, engaging those partners in the fight against ISIS. Um, if you could, can you speak to the importance of engaging some of those partners and, and how we are moving forward in that fight against ISIS? Sure. So uh, in, in the Indo-Asia Pacific, the countries that we work closely, closest with uh, in the ISIS fight uh, are Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Bangladesh. And that's us, Australia, and New Zealand that are involved in this effort to work with those countries to help them uh, fight that threat themselves. Uh, and the entity that does that for me is SOCPAC, Special Operations Command Pacific. Uh, and they are, uh, 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 Major General Brian Fenton and his team are actively engaged in providing uh, uh, advice, advice and assistance uh, to those countries, uh, most principally right now in the Philippines, in the southern Philippines. So I'm, I'm encouraged by the work they're doing. Uh, I, I think it's... Yeah, it's God's work, uh, and I'm pleased with where we are uh, in that fight. In Thank the, you in the very much. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Sullivan has to go to Florida preside. Senator Hirono is graciously yielded. Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, my colleague, Senator Hirono from Hawaii. I very much appreciate the uh, letting me uh, jump ahead there. You know, in uh, Alaska and Hawaii, we have a lot invested in this, as you know, Admiral, given that our, our citizens are going to be impacted sooner than anyone else with regard to the ballistic miss missile, intercontinental ballistic missile threat. I just want to begin by thanking you again for your service, Admiral. Um, would you agree that we're clearly in a more direct threat phase with regard to the North Korean challenge to, to our citizens? I agree, that, Senator. And, you know, we were all over at the White House describing a, a strategy integrated strategy that the administration is putting together with regard to very focused initially on enhanced diplomacy. But do you also believe that the threat of military force or at least keeping it on the table actually enhances our diplomatic efforts? Uh, it, it, it does. Uh, I, I believe that the, the best uh, enhancement to diplomacy is a strong military capability. You mentioned the unprecedented weapons testing. I have a chart that I want you to take a look at, um, and also not if, but when North Korea will have a capacity to range the continental United States. So again, Hawaii and Alaska would be ranged earlier with the ICBM. Um, the chart shows that Kim Jong-un has actually conducted more tests than his uh, father and grandfather combined. Do you see that abating at all? I do not see it abating at all uh, if the trajectory remains as you have depicted on the graphic. And, he's, are, and he's learning even when he fails. Right. Yeah, he is not afraid to fail in public. So one thing, just for my colleagues here, we're, we're going to be working on a bipartisan uh, enhanced missile defense, homeland missile defense bill, and I certainly think that that's an order, and hopefully we'll be able to get a number of members on this committee to be co-sponsors of that. Uh, Admiral, I, want, I next want to turn to the South China Sea and the issue of freedom of navigation operations. Earlier, you had mentioned that uh, high-level assurances that the Chinese weren't doing that. Uh, standing next to the president in the 
uh, Rose Garden, President Xi stated, quote, China does not intend to pursue the militariz militarization of these islands. So uh, what, what do you make of that statement by the president of China? Uh, I wanted to believe him. But, but they have do, you, do you believe, since he made that, I think it was a year and a half ago, what's happened? They have militarized the South China Sea, sir. So despite the fact that the president was standing next to our president, uh, that was not an accurate statement. The reality is that China has militarized the South China Sea. Um, and I think you have a, well, I have a, you know, maybe it's the other graphic, but if you look at a graphic of Fiery Cross Reef, you'll see uh, a 10,000 foot runway, weapons em emplacements, fighter aircraft hangars, uh, and barracks for troops. Clearly, that, that, that facility, which is, uh, you know, 700 acres, uh, a military facility, with all of that capability doesn't exist, does not exist to, to, to rescue a, the, the odd fisherman that gets lost out there. Yeah. This committee, as you know, has been very interested in the, our policies and execution with regard to freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. The Trump administration is developing its own policies. I was supportive of uh, Secretary Carter's uh, pronouncements of flying, sailing, and operating anywhere international law allows, but the execution of that was done rather meekly. Could you give us a sense, as the new administration is developing these policies, what principles they should be looking at, uh, the important role of whether we're doing it under innocent passage or not? And also, when you look at this last graph, this last chart, uh, you see that the Scarborough Shoal has not been militarized yet, but it's very strategic. And what would happen if that became militarized by China, and what should we do to stop that militarization? Should we draw a red line at that important um, geographic point in the South China Sea? Just give us a sense on those issues, Innocent Passage, Allies, Scarborough Shoal, what, what we should be looking at, what the new Trump administration should be looking at in terms of their FONOPS policy in the South China Sea. So, uh, Senator, I, I've... Uh, made clear to this committee and other uh, testimonies to other committees that, that I'm a supporter of freedom of navigation operations. And I think we should do them not to send a signal about territoriality or sovereignty or anything like that. We should send a signal that we do, in fact, fly, sail, or operate wherever international law allows. Uh, and the freedom of navigation operations exists just for that reason, to exercise our freedom of navigation. And the freedom of navigation that's exercised uh, or could be exercised by all countries uh, in the world. So one of the beneficiaries of our freedom of navigation operations uh, in the South China Sea would be China, for example, in other waters. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's the right of all nations uh, to operate uh, uh, in accordance with international law. Uh, so I'm, I believe we should continue to do those. Now, there's a whole range of them, whether you challenge uh, what uh, is considered an illegal baseline claim, uh, whether you do innocent passage and don't notify uh, 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 a country who, who maintains that you must notify them before you do an innocent passage, or uh, you can uh, go within uh, 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 a 12 mile territorial limit uh, of uh, an island or feature or whatever that doesn't deserve one under international law. So there's any number of ways uh, to, to, to conduct freedom of navigation operations, and we should not limit ourselves uh, to any of those. Uh, with regard to Scarborough Shoal, uh, I think it's a, a, an important part of, uh, uh, of this region uh, for the reasons depicted on that chart. Uh, it would give China a quote-unquote trifecta uh, of uh, bases uh, in the South China Sea with uh, uh, Woody Island and the Paracels to the uh, northwest, uh, the Spratleys and their seven bases there uh, to the south, uh, and then Scarborough Shoal would give them uh, um, a, a key uh, base uh, in the northeast. They have not done that yet. Uh, I hesitate to draw red lines. Uh, I, I think red lines uh, are, are problematic for a number of reasons, uh, but we should communicate clearly, clearly with China uh, that, that we do not uh, uh, want them uh, uh, to militarize to reclaim 
and then militarize uh, Scarborough Shoal. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on behalf of Chairman McCain, Senator Hirono, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Aloha, Admiral Harris, and uh, always good to see you. Thank you for your service. Um, there's a lot of focus, of course, on the ongoing and the heightened threat from North Korea, and in light of that, of course, I want to ensure that is adequately pr protected. PMRF is a national treasure that cannot be replicated anywhere else uh, with its undersea and missile testing ranges. There's been discussion about operationalizing Aegis ashore located at PMRF. Is Hawaii adequately protected at this time given intelligence assessments of North Korea's current capability and the missile defense systems we have in place? And uh, Going forward, as uh, North Korea's capabilities have advanced, what will be needed to defend the U.S. and, in particular, Hawaii from uh, Korean advancements, North Korean advancements? Yeah, thanks, Senator. I agree with you that the uh, Pacific Missile Range Facility uh, on Kauai is a national treasure. Uh, I, I think that uh, I've gone on record as, as uh, supporting the idea uh, that we should uh, uh, develop and acquire a Defense of Hawaii radar, uh, radar. that gives Hawaii uh, the ability to, to, to see the space, uh, if you will, uh, in the face of potential ballistic missile attacks. We, de we have the SBX, uh, that's the X-band um, uh, radar that, that sits on a, on a self-propelled oil platform uh, that has to be sustained uh, and uh, uh, refurbished and all of that. Uh, and I think a, a land-based permanent facility uh, to do that uh, defensive Hawaii radar is, is necessary. Uh, I believe today uh, General Robinson will tell you that Hawaii is adequately defended. Uh, I think in the future, as North Korea continues its weapons development program, uh, that we need to look at all ways uh, to improve the defense of Hawaii, including ground-based interceptors. I think we should study putting ground-based interceptors uh, in Hawaii. I'm not smart enough to know uh, if, if we should or not, but I think we should study it. Uh, and, 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 and I think that would be the complement uh, to a defensive Hawaii radar. Do you have any sense as to the, uh, the time frame for moving from the radar capability that we, you say we need to develop right now and going with uh, the ground-based? No, ma'am, I do not have that uh, idea. Thank you. Congress has called for headquarters reductions in recent years, and while I agree with reducing redundancy where it makes sense and eliminating waste, I am not a fan of salami slice percentage cuts across headquarters enemy, uh, uh, entities. So uh, I'm a strong advocate of taking a look at each headquarters operations, the personnel mix, the evolving threats and challenges it faces, as well as previous growth of a particular headquarters before recommending any cuts. So as you mentioned in your testimony, PACOM has been in its ARR for um, four of the five challenges which drive U.S. defense planning and budgeting, and so that's in your ARR. Can you talk about PACOM headquarters in terms of staffing levels over the last 20 years or so, reductions you have taken or are about to be applied in light of the challenges you face, including a hostile North Korea, a rising China, Russia, and uh, uh, ISIS in your AOR, and how will actual and proposed staffing reductions impact PACOM's ability to succeed with all of the challenges you face? Yes, ma'am. So uh, over the past 40 years, PACOM has averaged less than 800 personnel. And that's officers, enlisted personnel, and civilians, DOD civilians. Uh, and we've been pretty consistent over 40 years uh, at that level. Uh, and PACOM is, is the, 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 the largest geographic uh, combatant command uh, with, with one of the smallest staffs. Uh, that said, uh, I, I think that uh, you know, we, we all should seek uh, efficiencies where we can. Uh, but I'm not uh, 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 supportive of the idea of salami slicing either. So across that 40 years of, of, uh, 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 of staff uh, uh, manning levels at PACOM, the threat has increased. Mm -hmm. Because in that intervening 40 years, now we have, uh, we don't have a bipolar world anymore. You know, we, we have the threats I talked about in my testimony, uh, China, Russia, uh, uh, North Korea uh, and ISIS. So um, I'm, I continue to, 
to, to my, and my staff, we continue to work closely with OSD, the Office of Secretary of Defense, and the Joint Staff uh, on our manning levels. And I, I, I'd like to, um, I'd like for us to be very cognizant of the kind of impacts that the across the board types of cuts will have. And you've already mentioned, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to get to one more question. You've already mentioned the, the support that you have for APSI. Um, in your written testimony, you state that you have concerns about some of the changes made to security cooperation authorities in the 27th NDAA, and I just wanted you to give you an opportunity to tell us how these changes could impact the DOD uh, counter-narcotic and transnational crime programs in the PACOM AOR. Yeah, it, it, would, it, would, it, it could potentially, depending on how the cuts are actually affected, it could dramatically affect uh, JIDF West, the Joint Interagency Task Force West, which goes after counter-narcotics programs. I'm also concerned about programs like IMET, uh, International Military Education and Training, which I think is the best, uh, uh, one of the best foreign assistance programs out there. Because that's where we bring foreign uh, bright, light, uh, uh, bright, uh, up-and-coming uh, mid-grade officers to the United States for senior military education for a year at a time with their families, and they get immersed in American culture, uh, ideas, uh, and uh, living in an environment uh, where we practice daily uh, civilian control of the military. So I, th I think it's important that we fund these programs, uh, and, and, and I'm concerned if those programs were to be cut. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on behalf of Chairman Kame, Senator Rounds, please. Thank you, sir. Admiral, first of all, thank you for your service to our country. Um, I think the first time that we met was um, in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on Senator Inhofe's uh, CODEL with him, and uh, your briefing to our CODEL that day was alarming, to say the least, and, and eye-opening with regard to the breadth, the scope, the size of the area in which your team was responsible for the security, not just of our forces, but in conjunction with our allies as well. One item that, that caught our attention at that time was simply the time frame in which to respond to uh, adversarial activity. I, I'd like to talk about some of the newer, newer uh, technologies that are being employed or that may be very well employed in the near future. In particular, uh, I mean, when we talk about the, the unique problem set that you've got there, uh, the trifecta of few land-based areas from which to operate extreme distances, uh, some of the most challenging and contested environments to operate, and I believe the deterrence value uh, of long-range strike to hold targets at risk, targets that are quickly becoming harder and harder to, to access. What are your thoughts on the possibility of a conventional warhead variant of the proposed long-range standoff weapon? So, uh, Senator, I, I think that, that uh, we're going to have to look at that in terms of INF, uh, because currently, you know, that's the law that's the treaty that we, we follow if, if, if you're talking the land-based uh, uh, capability. We're not limited uh, in air and surface think, launch, and I think we should Thinking explore, about an air launch, the, yeah, the I, air I think launch. we should explore all of that because more capability against the threats we face is what is needed uh, in, in the Pacific Command. What about um, with regard to hypersonics? Right now, I think uh, in, in uh, open source documents, there's some pretty clear evidence that both Russia and China have been looking at hypersonics, the ability to deliver weapons at Mach 5.0. So, so I have to be careful when I talk hypersonics in, in, in an open hearing. But I am concerned about Chinese and Russian hypersonic weapons development. Uh, and, uh, and I've uh, uh, expressed those concerns uh, in the right places. Is this an area where perhaps our own technology development needs to be reviewed in terms of our ability to respond to. Uh, I, I, those I think that we we, we must uh, uh, improve our ability to defend against and conduct hypersonic defend against hypersonic weapons and develop our own hypersonic weapons. But again, in the development of hypersonic weapons, offensive hypersonic weapons, we're going to run up against treaty restrictions. We've been talking now about some unique types of new weapon developments, both ours and theirs. And at the same time, when we talk about readiness, it seems that we sometimes 
uh, get caught up and we assume that we're simply being able to maintain the readiness that's necessary. I'd like to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about perhaps our lack of readiness in some areas. And in particular, I'm thinking uh, right now, as an example, every time we get together with, with a team of experts such as yourself, we hear some perhaps horror stories about the inability to even take care of some of our existing assets. In particular, I'm going to draw attention to the fact that we've got the USS Boise setting at port, not in depot, but at port. Here's a, a, a nuclear-powered submarine, which is not operational at this time, and I understand that there are two other uh, boats in the same category. Could you perhaps give, can you give us any anecdotal or additional information on other areas in which you've seen or been frustrated by our inability to maintain the readiness necessary for you to do your mission? So, so that's one of the issues that, that fall into the service uh, chief's bailiwicks, if you will. Their, 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 their responsibility is to man, train, and equip the force for use by the combatant commanders in meeting uh, the National Command Authority's responsibilities. So I, too, share your concerns when I look across the enterprise, not just at the Navy, but across the enterprise, uh, at shortfalls in uh, follow-on force and surge force readiness. Prepared to give us any examples? Uh, no, sir, not in this hearing. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Once again, thank you for your service, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the chairman, let me recognize Senator Donnelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Admiral. Thank you so much for your service to the country. Um, uh, when we were home uh, here in the Senate, working in our states, was when this uh, developed with the aircraft carrier. And so based on the, the words of the President and Secretary Mattis, I spent that time uh, in meeting after meeting with people in Indiana telling them how serious we take this North Korea situation and telling them we take it so serious that we have our aircraft carrier, the Carl Vinson, heading to North Korea uh, right now. It turned out that was wrong. I, I felt misled, and I think my constituents were misled as well. And w what I don't understand is that when those comments were made, how, they, how, how n nobody said anything that, hey, this is wrong. Um, this is not correct. And so my question is, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? And I know other members um, asked about this as well. But I don't want to be in a position of having the people in my state think one thing and the reality is something else when we all take a pledge that we'll speak truth to power, that if we see something that's not correct, we'll tell people, we'll let them know. And, um, you know, I have great concern about that. Sir, I, I can't say I'm sorry enough, but I'll try no, to... No, I'm not that. asking you to say you're so, sorry. So, I mean, I'm accountable for and responsible for the messaging that came out of, of that Carl Vinson issue. But at the end of the day, what we said was that Carl Vinson was leaving Singapore, truncating its exercise, canceling its port visit, and heading to Northeast Asia. But, and that's where it is today. It's within striking power, striking range of, of, uh, of uh, North Korea if the president were to call on it. Now... That messaging was, was not done well, and, and that messaging is, 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 is on me. Well, and, and no, no actually, it was, it was, we heard the President and Secretary Mattis say exercises are being canceled, it's heading to North Korea right now. I mean, to say, you know, someday I'm going to the, I'm going to the cemetery. I hope it's not next week. I hope it's not next year. Right. But at some point, I'm going to the cemetery, so I would say, I'm going to the cemetery, that's technically correct. Right. Um, but... I just want to make sure that the information I give to the people in my state is accurate. And if you can make sure, uh, if you see something that you look at and you go, look, this really seems sideways, that it be communicated right away so that the people of this country actually know what's going on and our allies know what's going on. Have you seen any sanctions against North Korea that have worked or that have slowed down uh, Kim Jong-un's efforts to... None. 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 Have uh, you seen in the, in the last month or the last couple of months that Kim Jong-un slow down his efforts to achieve his goals of mating up the nuclear warhead with missiles? Uh, I haven't seen anything in the last, uh, since, since I've been at Pacific Command. In the, in the last month, though, since President Trump and, and President Xi got together 
Uh, and uh, President Xi and China seem to be uh, more willing uh, to exercise their influence on North Korea. Uh, North Korea hasn't done any of the testing uh, that, that uh, Senator Sullivan showed on his graph, the, the bad testing, the nuclear uh, test uh, or ICBM testing. Uh, and I, I think it's early days yet to, 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 to draw a direct correlation. I think we're going to have to wait and see and give President Xi and China a chance, uh, assuming that in that interim period, Kim Jong-un doesn't do a nuclear test or an ICBM test or something like that. What is, what is your understanding, and, and, and by that I mean PACOM's understanding, of China's biggest influence point pushing back against North Korea, where North Korea will pay attention? Where, where, China's, where China's biggest uh, strength yeah. to slow down North Korea and their efforts is? Uh, I, I think their biggest strength in doing that is economic. Eighty percent of North Korea's economy is China-based. Eighty percent. So I think China has... Uh, a powerful lever to apply uh, on North Korea. And, and from China's perspective, you know, they're concerned about two things. They're concerned about a unified Korean peninsula that's aligned with the United States, and they're worried about uh, refugees should, the northern, should North Korea collapse uh, uh, precipitously. Well, the, the time went by so fast, I have a, a million more questions for you, but I'll, I'll only ask one more, and that is... Um, the rules of engagement for our ships. Are any of our ships sailing solo right now um, in near Korean waters, North Korean waters? And if so, do we have a plan that if they are intercepted or engaged, that we have air cover for them immediately, that we have fellow ships coming by immediately so that they are protected and we don't have another Pueblo-type situation? Uh, that's a great question. And all of our ships that are operating uh, in uh, the Sea of Japan East Sea area uh, operate under uh, standing rules of engagement, and they have what they need, in my opinion and belief, to defend themselves. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on behalf of Chairman McCain, Senator Perdue, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral, thank you, and thank you for all the men and women in your um, theater. You know, since the Barbary Pirates and our first five frigates, the United States has always dealt with our foreign policy and, and our national interests from a position of strength. I'm very concerned as we sit here today that we're in the middle of a paradigm shift relative to the other superpowers. Um, in your mind, since 2000, uh, China has, has spent or is spending today uh, approximately six times more on their military, and these are constant dollars, 2016 dollars. Is that directionally correct in your mind, about six times compared to just 15 years ago? Um, Probably, sir, but I don't. I don't have the data. Well, that's, but, that's, but, uh, but I've seen the, uh, you know, the 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 curve. Yes, sir. And and the curve is dramatic, uh, in the amount of uh, defense spending that they they're doing based on just what they tell us, and and they're probably spending higher. Well, that's what I want to get to. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, uh, their numbers, and the, and I believe that that China is spending more than even these numbers uh, reveal. That that's an 11 percent compound annual growth rate just since 2000. Um, here's the real problem. In 2017, they're going to spend about $240 billion in, um, but adjusted for purchasing power parity, in real terms, apples to apples to, uh, to the United States, that's $826 billion compared to our $630 billion. Directionally, would you think that's reasonable to look at it that way? Uh, I think it would be. We've looked at uh, purchasing power parity uh, in a general sense with, uh, uh, with regards to China. Uh, and they reached that purchasing power parity point uh, already uh, in, in, uh, uh, with regard in, in comparison with the United States. Well, I lived over there, and I've, I've manufactured over there, I've sold over there, and when you adjust the currency and the ability that they have to buy uh, their uh, weapons and their systems cheaper than we are, and I look at the developments just this year of you know, you, you educated me uh, a year or so ago about their DF-26, the, the carrier killer. The, the first aircraft was coming online this year. The fact that 95% uh, of their missiles violate the INF Treaty and that they far outrange our capabilities today. Uh, would you say today, sir, that China's on parity with the United States military capability in uh, the Pacific region? I would not uh, in terms of our asymmetric advantages and the quality of, of our equipment and our people. That said, quantity has a quality all its own, and, and they are uh, 
uh, swiftly moving to exceed the United States in terms of, of numbers of ships and submarines and aircraft and the like. So we have to continue to, 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 to work and resource that those asymmetric advantages that we have. And certainly China is trying to close that gap in, in every regime. So within the next five years, if you continue that trajectory, there's every reason to believe on a purchasing power parity basis that they will actually double the amount of investment that we have in the military. That's just a, a projection. But what I'm concerned about is this. Independent of the money, I believe we have a supply chain war. You've talked about it today. It takes us much longer. It's much more expensive. We have many more regulations to go through. Tell us what we can do to help you as a combatant commander uh, compete uh, in the supply chain war that you have to deal with as well. You say that your, your quote here today is, I don't have what I need today uh, against the current threats. And we know that their threats are only going to increase geometrically over the next five to 10 years. I believe they've got a 2025 strategy. And I'm very concerned. You've talked about that as well. Tell us what we can do to help you, sir. Senator, I, I think that the the best thing that the Congress can do to, to help me today uh, is end sequestration and give us a budget. When you look at uh, the China strategy uh, in the uh, Southeast um, Asia region, particularly in the South China Sea, it's pretty easy. You've said they've militarized it. I agree with that. What are their intentions for that outer ring of islands? It looks like the next level of national interest. Uh, I'm talking about the Marianas and Guam all the way to Palau. In that, in that area. Have you seen any indications now that they have uh, sites on those as well? Uh, uh, not indications like what we're seeing in the South China Sea where they're doing land reclamation activities and that kind of stuff, island building. Uh, but they are working to influence countries in that region, small island nations, uh, economically, uh, to bring them in line uh, with their worldview. Two last questions real quick. Are you concerned about the PLA's recent reorganization and then also the Russia-China cooperation? It's at a, at a higher level now. It's been in 30 years. Uh, are you concerned about those two developments with regard to the PLA? I am concerned about the former, which is the, the, the PLA's reorganization into joint theater commands. So we went through a period of, of, of joint uh, integration, if you will, uh, as a result of the Goldwater Nichols Act in the in the in the late 80s, mid 80s, uh, and since then, I think we've become uh, a much more effective joint fighting force across our military. Mm. And and I think China is learning from that. They're they're, they're they watch, they study, and, and they're going to this theater joint uh, combined command structure. And I think that will make them better. It certainly made us better, and I worry about that. Uh, and uh, 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 and then your second the Russia China cooperation, the, Russia the military cooperation um, today. I, I I think that's more temporary, more uh, 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 because they need each other right now more than uh, anything else. And I would be concerned about. I, I would not be um, concerned about a long term alliance with Russia and China if history is a guide. So, thank you, sir. Thank you. On behalf of the Chairman, uh, Senator Blumenthal, please. Thanks, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, sir, for being with us again. And thank you to you and the men and women under your command for their extraordinary service to our nation. Uh, when you were here last year, you told me that you were concerned about Russian and Chinese undersea warfare capabilities, specifically their modernized submarines, and you noted Number one, the Russians took no break from developing submarine capability following the Cold War, and they have ballistic missile submarines now in their force fleet in the Pacific. Number two, the Chinese are building a new class of such submarines that may have the capability to threaten us. And you also told us that your submarine requirement in PACOM still has not been met. In your testimony this year, you mentioned a second a ballistic missile submarine in the Pacific and the Russians plan to build and send six new attack submarines to the Pacific by 2021. And you state, I'm quoting, potential adversary submarine activity has tripled from 2008 levels, tripled 
requiring a corresponding increase of U.S. activity to maintain undersea superiority, end quote. You, I think, support the Navy's 2016 force structure assessment, which calls for an increase from 48 to 66 attack submarines as part of a larger 355-ship Navy. Uh, in February, Acting Secretary of the Navy Sean Stackley submitted to Secretary Mattis an accelerated fleet plan, which supports three additional Virginia submarines, one more in FY21, FY22, and FY23, respectively. Are you supportive of this accelerated plan, and do you believe that it will give you, give our nation, the necessary capability to address these looming and increasing threats from both Russia and China in the Pacific? Sure, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm completely supportive uh, of the plan, and I'm completely supportive of the effort to, to move to the left uh, construction of these Virginia-class submarines. They will clearly uh, increase our nation's capability and, and, if assigned to PACOM, PACOM's capability. But three or four uh, are inadequate in the, in, the, in the grand scheme based simply on my requirements, which have to be uh, uh, adjudicated uh, with the requirements of all the other combatant commands who have legitimate needs uh, for submarines in their regions as well. Can you give us an assessment of our adversaries' uh, anti-submarine warfare capability? Yeah. Uh, so today... Uh, the U.S. reigns supreme uh, in the undersea realm and in anti-submarine warfare. Uh, but uh, our adversaries, particularly uh, China and Russia, are closing that gap because they understand that, that, that the gap exists and they're working to, to, to reduce our asymmetric advantage. Uh, I think that we have to continue to uh, keep that advantage. You know, I don't want it to be a fair fight if we have to go into a fight with these folks. Uh, and that, that means that, that we have to continue to resource uh, the development and the continued development of uh, our undersea capability and our anti-submarine warfare capabilities. Does, does North Korea have significant anti-submarine warfare capability? Uh, they do not. And are they developing that capability? Yeah, they're, 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 they're working on it. They're trying. I mean, they have uh, submarines. Uh, they have a lot of them, a lot of smaller submarines. They're diesels. Uh, and they have an SSB, uh, which is a ballistic missile-capable diesel submarine. And so they recognize the advantages and what the submarine gives them in terms of war fighting. Um, but they're a long way from developing a submarine force that's comparable to to any other country that we were talking about in the region. Uh, on the F-35 in your testimony, you note, quote, the forward stationing and deployment of fifth-generation airframes to the region continues to be a priority for your command. Uh, do you continue to believe that the F-35 is necessary in that part of the world for the defense of our allies? Japan is going to be acquiring them and others. Uh, Senator, I, I believe that the F-35 is critical most in PACOM than in any other, any other region uh, of the world because of the threat that we face uh, and what the F-35 brings to the fight. And the F-22 is also the, the, uh, uh, from uh, Hawaii and Alaska. Uh, and so th those fifth-generation fighters uh, will allow us to get inside the A2 AD area uh, d uh, uh, denial uh, uh, area defense capabilities of our uh, uh, adversaries, particularly China and, and the region. We're going to need fifth generation fighters to get in there, uh, and, and they provide that. Thank you very much, Admiral. Thanks for your great work at PACOM and throughout your career. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Chairman, Senator Graham, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Admiral. I want to echo that. Um, to thank you for your service and all those that are with you here today and in, in your command. Uh, is China's activity in the South China Sea, in terms of militarizing the region, getting better or worse or about the same? 
Um, I, I, I'm not sure what better means, but they are militarizing more now than they were last year. I would say that's worse. That, and and that, from our perspective, that is worse. You're did, do they understand that we're serious about that's a bad thing? Uh, I believe they are. And they apparently don't care? Uh, to date. All right. So how do we make them care? Uh, I, I think we have to demonstrate credible combat power on the one hand uh, and, and powerful diplomacy on the other. Okay. Um, is, it, is it fair to say that unless something changes, North Korea is likely to have an ICBM with a nuclear warhead that can reach America by 2020? Uh, I, I, I don't want to put a timeline on, on that, sir, in this hearing, but, but it is safe to say that they will have one soon. Okay. They will match rhetoric to capabilities. Okay, great. Um, why do they want that missile? I beg your pardon? What's the purpose of having that missile? One, they want to be recognized as a nuclear power. Okay. Uh, and two, they want to ensure uh, their survival. Okay. In their mind, it's an insurance policy? Partly. Okay. Uh, from an American point of view, what kind of threat does that present to us? Uh, it, it presents today, uh, even though uh, I, I don't believe they have the full capability today, they threaten the, the 28,000 American troops right. in South Korea plus their families, 55,000 American troops plus their families in Japan, our South Korean and Japanese allies. What about, Guam, what about the Guam. homeland? If they get Guam. an ICBM with a nuclear weapon attached, what kind of threat do you De see that at the homeland? Depending on the, on the nuclear weapon, depending on the missile, they could reach uh, the eastern seaboard. They could reach us right here in this building. Is it fair to say that's what they want to do in the western part of the United States? California is probably easier target initially. Uh, I, I, I believe they want to be able to threaten okay. the United States. Well, what kind of threat would that be to us? That would be a bad thing, right? That would be a terrible thing, sir. Okay. So do you believe it should be the policy of the United States never to let that happen? I beg your pardon? It should be the policy of the United States to never allow North Korea to develop an ICBM with a warhead that could hit America. Uh, I believe that's correct. Okay. Uh, do you believe that the only way they'll change that policy, uh, their desire, is if they believe that the regime could be taken down by us if they continue to develop an ICBM? Uh, Without credible military threat in the mind of the North Koreans, they're going to plow ahead. Uh, I I believe that generally, but I believe that China might be able to exert its influence. Do you believe China could change North Korea's behavior absent a belief by North Korea that we would use military force to stop their ICBM program? Uh, I do not. Okay. Do you believe that China would act stronger and more bold if they believed credible military force was on the table to stop North Korea? Uh, I do. So it seems to me that the policy of the United States, given the admiral's advice, and you are really good at what you do, that we should all agree that it's not good for America, for North Korea to have an ICBM with a warhead attached. And it's really not good for China, is it? Uh, I believe it's not good for China. You're well, correct. why don't they believe that? Because they have their own calculus, their own... Uh, uh, do you think they're beginning process. to reshape their calculus in light of the, our reaction to North Korea? Uh, I, I hope so, but it's early days. Okay. Uh, in terms of China leverage on North Korea, you said it was substantial. Uh, it, their, their leverage is potentially substantial. substantial. The best way to avoid a military conflict with North Korea over their missile program is for China <clears throat> to wake up North Korea to the reality of what threat that presents to North Korea and China. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. Is it also fair to say that we do not have any intentions of invading North Korea <laughs> at all. I mean, that's not that, on our... That, that, nobody's told you, get ready to invade North Korea. That, that is not fair to say, sir. I, I believe the president has said that all options are on the table. No, yeah, but I mean, we're not going to just go in and take North Korea down for sir, the heck I, of it. I, 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 I'm, I don't want to get into what we could or couldn't okay. do. Well, North Korea thinks we're going to invade in any moment. Do you think that's part of our national security strategy, is without provocation to attack North Korea? Well, I, I, I think North Korea has provided provocation already in terms but of... But without North provocation, Korea. it's not our policy to attack North Korea. They have provoked us already, sir. Yeah, I said, but if they stopped it, then, they don't have anything then, then to worry about. Then we will about. have to look at it. You know, that's, that's all decision. I'm saying. That's a decision in that... In case that North Korea is listening, right. none of us want to, like, invade your country. They are. <laughs> okay, well, good. So here's the point. 
All this military force going that way is to deter them from being able to hit us and protect our allies, right? Right. We're, we're trying to deter them from hurting us. We're not sending a bunch of people over there to invade their country without provocation. Is right. that fair to say? Right. Good. I hope they understand that, and I hope China understands that. Thank you. Yes, sir. On behalf of the Chairman, Senator McCaskill, please. Thank you. Um, last year, Admiral uh, General Scaparetti um, testified at this hearing that North Korea has one of the largest chemical and biological weapon stockpiles and research programs in the world. Do you agree with that assessment? I do. And do you believe um, that the facts that we know about the death of the half-brother to Kim Jong-un um, was likely assassinated with uh, uh, VX nerve agent? Yeah, I, I, I do, Senator. That's just based on open source reporting. Right. Um, so I, I'm... I'm um, I, I, have we, but we haven't confirmed that it was used. I beg your pardon? We have not independently confirmed that it was used. Uh, I, I have not seen reporting uh, uh, to reflect that. So do, we, uh, do you know enough about the delivery capabilities of chemical and biological weapons at this point to adequately be prepared to defend um, our allies and um, our American soldiers and families in the surrounding vicinities? Uh, uh, I don't know enough about all of their capabilities, and, and including those that we saw or probably saw uh, in Malaysia. So, so I think that's part of the... Uh, uh, readiness calculus uh, that we have to go through when we consider the threat from North Korea. Do you have the uh, appropriate uh, CBRN, which is an acronym for the record that is, is our defense, um, equipment necessary uh, for uh, chemical uh, and biological uh, uh, attacks? Uh, uh, I believe that General Brooks does have that for the forces that are in Korea now. Okay. What about in, in Japan? Uh, I, I can't speak to that. I, okay. I would love a follow-up on that. Yes, ma'am. I think, um, you know, we do chem stuff at Fort Leonard Wood in, in Missouri. It's our biological defense uh, center, and I'm concerned if they are using nerve agents to kill family members, they certainly are not going to hesitate to use nerve agents to kill American soldiers and our South Korean allies and innocent citizens. So I, I'd like a, to follow up on that. You bet. Um, do you think we should deploy THAAD to Japan? Uh, I believe that's a decision that Japan's going to have to make. I think that Japan uh, should have some kind of a system like that, but whether it's that or Aegis Ashore or both or some other system, uh, they're going to have to make that decision. Well, I, um, I, as you know, uh, I had the opportunity to take a exhausting tour of all of our anti-ballistic missile systems last year, and you kindly hosted us when we were at PACOM, um, but had a chance to be in both South Korea and see the Patriot systems, understand that THAAD was going in, and also obviously in Guam uh, to observe the THAAD. Um, I, I just want to make sure we know what the needs are in terms of THAAD in light of what North Korea is up right. to. So, so we work with Japan and, and describe the capability that THAAD would provide it would, that would give them uh, also Aegis Ashore and, and potentially other systems. So uh, that will be a Japanese decision. Or it could be an alliance. But we're, we are indicated to them that we would be cooperative in trying to deploy right. THAAD to Japan. Right. Okay. Right. Well, um, uh, we, to be clear on that, I, I have not reached an agreement with Japan on deploying THAAD. Right. But that's a different issue than, uh, than your initial question, which was should Japan buy THAAD? Right. And so, you know, if they buy it, then it's, it's theirs, uh, and, and it relieves me of the burden of, of, of having to deploy it in, in the joint force. Right. So I, I think that, that that whole decision, whether they buy that or Aegis Ashore or ask us to support them or whatever, you know, that's a decision yet to be made. It seems to me that the discussion um, that we're trying to have about pressure on China to do the right thing, especially in light of what I learned from you in terms of China's activities and militarization in, in South China Sea, that um, uh, the more talk we have publicly about FAD, more places, I think the more it behooves what, what I think is our policy right now as it relates to North Korea. Very quickly, uh, I don't think anybody's um, touched on what I have been um, 
really confused by and worried by in light of how important the Philippines is to the United States military. Could you assess the current situation of the U.S.-Philippines relations uh, as it, because I know what strategic importance those islands have to your capability of, of uh, defending the United States of America? So, uh, ma'am, I, I believe that we're in a, a reasonably good place in the mill-to-mill space with the, our forces of the Philippines, AFP, if you will. Uh, so we, we have a range of activities that we continue to do with the AFP, uh, including uh, Bulacatan, which is a big exercise that kicks off next month in May. Uh, our EDCA, that's Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, that's the, the five, or f- uh, five Philippine bases that we have agreed to uh, with the government of the Philippines to uh, improve, for, uh, in some cases, for us to use. Uh, that is proceeding apace. Uh, Most importantly, our Special Operations Command folks are active uh, in in the southern Philippines to combat terrorism uh, in conjunction with and in support of uh, our forces of the Philippines. So our guys are are doing the advising and assisting, but not the direct action. That's the responsibility of, of their armed forces of the Philippines there, and I think that's working. So Duterte is not having a negative impact on the mill-to-mill relationships, uh, is what you're telling me. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. That, that's, okay. That's well, that's reassuring because yeah. he kind of goes in the category with Kim Jong Un in terms right. of what the hell, right? Uh, we're in a good place in the mill-to-mill space uh, with the Philippines. Right. Okay. Thank you, Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, sort of parenthetically, your exchange with Senator Ernst about the importance of innovation. The center of innovation in this country is, of course, Silicon Valley and those innovative industries that are located in other parts of the country. We had testimony here a couple of m- months ago that Silicon Valley essentially won't deal with the Defense Department because of the, I, was, I, I would call it Byzantine, but that would be an insult to the Byzantine Empire. Uh, the the cumbersome and slow process in our procurement that is a urgent national priority in my opinion, uh, and I, I just wanted to echo that conversation. The second point I think that's important: all the discussion we've had in the last few days about North Korea in the last few weeks and months have focused on the ICBM and the threat to the homeland via a missile. The other problem that I think deserves attention is that North Korea is a serial proliferator of nuclear technology. And I think as serious a threat as an ICBM is is a nuclear weapon, a nuclear warhead in the hold of a tramp steamer sponsored by ISIS headed into Miami or the part of Baltimore. So that, to me, is an imminent threat that is almost as 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 uh, dangerous as the ICBM threat. So that that's got to be part of this calculation. Here's my question: Historically, the regimes in North Korea have gone through these cycles of provocation and rising tension, and then there's been some negotiation and concessions. If this is part of that pattern, what? Does Kim Jong Un want? Yeah. So, uh, Senator, I, I don't think it's any longer a part of the pattern of his grandfather uh, and his father. So, as you correctly stated, uh, in the past uh, they've gone into this provocation cycle. I've talked about it a, a lot in, in Hawaii, where there's a, a provocation, there's a negotiation, and there's a concession. Uh, they're peaceful for a while, and then the cycle starts again. Uh, I, I think Kim Jong Un has elevated that to a cycle of uh, provocation, 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 and what he is seeking is uh, a, his own independent nuclear deterrent in order to threaten the United States and to ensure uh, the continuance uh, of his regime. Well, to follow up on to follow up on Senator Graham's question, so if you go back to history, uh, this is often this situation that we're in now has often been analogized recently to the Cuban Missile Crisis, and part of the settlement in that case was we we had we had a military force and the threat of military force. We had the blockade, but ultimately there was an agreement not to invade Cuba, and that was part of the agreement that ended up with the missiles coming out. Is this a a moment if if regime? Preservation is his goal. Is there a moment where we could 
enter into s those kinds of negotiations? Sir, I, I, talk I, about I, a I don't want to, uh, you know, to, to, to limit the President's options uh, as he de decides which course of action to take. Uh, I'll simply say that in the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the key to that was credible combat power that allowed diplomacy to act. I completely agree. And I believe that, that my part of this, of this problem set is to provide that credible combat power in the face of North Korean provocation. I, I totally accept that. I understand that the, the Vincent has to be there and all the other capabilities that we have, and that, that's part of this process. But I'm talking about how do we, how do we eventually get out of this, and that involves some discussion of, of what, what is it that is necessary to uh, end this. China is a little puzzling to me because we've always talked about economic pressure, and China has, you, I agree, total pressure uh, ability with regard to North Korea. As I, there's no law that says that the missiles that he's developing and the nuclear weapons only can go south and east. He's as close to Beijing as he is to Tokyo. And if, if I were China, I would not want a nuclear-armed guy right on my border who could threaten me. And it seems to me that China really has to start to think about the threat that this, if, if he achieves this, suddenly he can threaten anybody within a thousand miles. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Um, finally, we talked about the, the vulnerability of Seoul. And I think it's, uh, I, when, as I talk to people in Maine, they're surprised to learn that, that Seoul is uh, about 30 miles from the North Korean border. Uh, from the DMZ and, and the enormous threat from just artillery. And you, we talked about that we don't have any defense for that now. Do the technologies that have been developed in conjunction with the Israelis, David Sling and Iron Dome, have any relevance in this case? Was Sir, that I, that might be I don't promising? know. I'm not smart enough on that. I'll have to get back to you on it. I'd appreciate that you because bet. that is a technology that's been effective in defending Israel from short-range rockets, and perhaps it would be something that uh, would, would change the, the, the uh, military calculus. Yeah. And, and I'll get back to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Well, thank you, Admiral. And uh, I think that what we're talking about that the North Koreans have is rockets, which are, would not lend itself to Iron Dome defenses. Uh, um, these are very difficult and challenging times, and it's very fortuitous that you are here before this committee, particularly after the briefing that we had yesterday at the White House. You've been able to give us some of the details that only a military commander can provide us with and will help us to make judgments. I don't think any of us are predicting conflict, and I think it would be wrong for us to do that. But I also believe that we should make every preparation, and although it would be military activity would be a last resort, it's something that we can't completely rule out. Uh, but I emphasize it would be absolutely, I know, that this president's last resort. But you're the tip of the spear, Admiral, and so the fact that you will have men and women ready if called upon is, and the testimony you've given today is uh, reassuring to this member and I believe to the other members of the committee. And I know how much you look forward to coming back and testifying before this committee. I know it's one of the highlights of your time as commander in the Pacific, but it uh, this testimony today was was extremely important, and I thank you for taking the time and uh, speaking in a very informative and articulate fashion. Senator Reid, did you want? Mr. Chairman, I, I, I concur, and I just uh, once again, Admiral, thank you, and make sure you thank the men and women in your command. Thank you. Thank you.
If you missed any of this hearing, you'll be able to see it again at cspan.org. A quick programming note, Senate Major uh, Minority Leader Chuck Schumer of New York will be holding a briefing with reporters at 12.15 p.m. Eastern Time, a little less than a half hour from now. We expect to hear more about uh, funding for the federal government through the end of the fiscal year, tax reform proposals uh, by the president, and other issues. 